Before him, Britain rarely had a victory. After him, there was rarely a defeat. He beat the French and threw them out of Portugal and Spain. He was a master at using terrain to give himself an advantage. He was the only commander to consistently defeat Napoleon's generals and finally the emperor himself at the Battle of Waterloo. I'm Major Gordon Corrigan. I've always been fascinated by military leadership. In this programme, I'm looking at Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington. How was it that a man condemned as a dunce at school and whose own mother thought he was stupid could learn how to become Britain's greatest general? In the late 18th century, the world was dominated by two superpowers, Britain and France, and they were at war. That war produced Napoleon Bonaparte, the greatest French general of the age, and over 20 years of bloodshed. Arthur Wellesley, later the Duke of Wellington, was born in Ireland, but he wasn't marked for greatness from birth. His family were minor aristocracy, but they had no money. His mother's problem was what to do with her ugly duckling. There to be no secure baths in politics for him. As a gentleman, trade was out of the question, and the family's estates, such as they were, weren't the birthright of a younger son. In his mother's opinion, he was fit only for powder, and so he joined the army. By the age of 25, he was commanding a battalion against the French. But this had absolutely nothing to do with ability. In those days, commissions and promotions were bought and sold for cash. Arthur had purchased his way up through the ranks and done precious little soldiering on the way. But there were things in his favour. He hadn't shone academically, but he did have a sharp and inquiring mind. And he was a voracious reader of military history. But above all, perhaps, he decided to take soldiering seriously. Over the next nine years, a professionalism and natural ability began to shine through. By the age of 34, he'd earned a promotion to Major General, as well as the loyalty and respect of his superiors. He had tremendous confidence and self-belief, evident in his most famous portrait, which hangs in his London home, Apsley House. Oh, this is marvellous. Yes. This is the one that's reproduced in all the books, isn't it? Reproduced in all the books, on the old £5 note, on most of the pub signs throughout Great Britain. This pose, I think, just shows his self-assurance, his uh, firmness uh, of purpose, the intense stare of the eyes. It fixes you, it challenges you. People later on in life pose the question to him, whether he was afraid of Napoleon and the French army, and he always said he refused to even consider the prospect of defeat. With this self-belief and refusal to consider defeat, Wellesley now headed for Portugal and Spain, occupied by Napoleon's army. Humiliating defeats and retreats marked the early stages of the Peninsula War. Then Willersley, soon to be Viscount Wellington, took command, and the British would never lose another major battle. Part of the reason for this was his fearless character. Napoleon's armies had beaten just about everybody in Europe. But as Wellington said, most of them were beaten before they started. I, at least, am not afraid. In Portugal, Wellington showed more key qualities of a great leader, an understanding of logistics and the importance of discipline. He went to defend Portugal, and he established a base in Lisbon so his army could be supplied by the Royal Navy. He knew that if his men were forced to plunder the land for supplies, they would become an unruly mob and discipline would break down. Wellington was forced to work with very little, but that compelled him to become an even better commander. 
Wellington was a canny operator. He had to be. He was nearly always outnumbered by the French, and unlike them, he didn't have vast reservoirs of conscripted manpower to call upon. So he always tried to make sure that he only fought a battle when he wanted to fight it, and on ground of his choosing. And ground is the key word. Wellington used terrain as an additional weapon in his arsenal. He was a master of using ground, and two examples from the Peninsular War show this brilliance. They also show evidence of another of Wellington's great qualities, his ability to plan and think ahead. This is one of Wellington's master strokes, the lines of Torres Vedras, one of the greatest feats of military engineering ever. It was built by 300,000 men, supervised by the Royal Engineers, and it's actually three lines of trenches, forts and gun positions that stretch for 26 miles from the River Tagus in the east to the Atlantic in the west. Trenches and gun positions were concealed amongst the hills. Behind the lines, Wellington's soldiers waited for the French. They were snug and safe and well supplied by the Navy, unlike the French who lived off the land. Wellington had the local people move behind the lines with all their animals and food. He then ordered all remaining crops to be destroyed. When the French approached, the land was bare. If they stayed where they were, they'd starve. So eventually, they had no choice but to withdraw back to Spain, pursued by Wellington's army, exactly as he had planned it. Here's what a French general wrote at the time. For a year and a half, the English had been working at these gigantic works. Most surprising of all, incredible in fact, the French government itself did not know that the hills had been fortified. For me, the most amazing thing about this whole caper is that the lines were built in absolute secrecy. A brilliant piece of deception by Wellington. And not just deception, but brilliant strategy too. Wellington had secured Portugal from attack, and now he could go on the offensive. Following the retreating French into Spain, where again he would use ground to give himself an advantage. The ancient Spanish city of Salamanca. The Romans were here, Hannibal was here, and Napoleon's army was here. And just a few miles to the south was fought the battle that was to be the turning point of the whole Peninsular War. It's sometimes said that Wellington could only fight defensive battles. And it was certainly true that if you only had one very small army, you had to be careful what you did with it. But at Salamanca, Wellington showed that he could seize the fleeting opportunity and go on the attack. For days, the two opposing armies had been shadowing each other, waiting for one to make a mistake. Eventually, Wellington concealed his men amongst the hills and waited for the French. After a few days, Wellington was having his lunch. It was just a chicken leg because he was quite a frugal eater. When the news came in that the French were on the move, what they'd done was to mistake the dust of the British baggage train for a wholesale retreat back to Portugal, completely failing to realize that the whole of the British army was in fact concealed behind these hills. By God, said Wellington, that'll do. Chucks his chicken leg over his shoulder, hops on his horse, gallops up here, has a look, sees the whole of the French army strung out along the line of march, and orders an immediate attack. You know more about this battlefield than any man alive. How did you get interested in it in the first place? Well, my grandfather was a farmer, and whenever he ploughed a field, we came here to the battlefield searching for musket balls. Oh, yes. Now, that's interesting because two musket balls, one smaller than the other, and the smaller one is the French one. We could fire their ammunition, but, but not vice yeah, versa. Definitely. Flints. Oh, yes. That's a very good name. Yeah. At 2 p.m., the battle began. 
Allied cavalry and infantry hammered into the flanks of the French. Fire! In minutes, the leading French division was blown away. And in a couple of hours, the whole French army was scattered. It was a great victory for Wellington. And after it, although there were still occasional British setbacks, the French were always on the back foot in Spain, and they never recovered. Wellington had pulled off a complex battle of manoeuvre. It was catastrophic for the French. They lost 15,000 men, the British 5,000. Intelligence and initiative won the day, and the glory was all Wellington's. The master tactician had again beaten the once invincible French. Even after all these years, just standing here today, you still get a feeling of what it must have been like on the day. Oh, you are completely right. It is more or less that in, it was 200 years ago. I'm completely sure that if Wellington was here, he would recognize every spot in the battlefield. And a lot of French blood into the soil here. Salamanca was the turning point in the Peninsula War. The French surrendered in 1814, and Napoleon was banished to the Mediterranean island of Elba. Wellington, now Duke, was lionized throughout Europe. He became British ambassador to Paris and then represented Britain at the Congress of Vienna when the victorious powers met to decide the future shape of Europe. It was while they were meeting that the news came through. The hound had slipped the leash. Napoleon, the sheep warrior of Europe, had left Elba and was on the loose. There was only one man who could stop him. And the Tsar of Russia turned to Wellington and said, it is for you to save the world again. Astonishingly, Wellington and Napoleon had never met. But that was about to change. The name Wellington for most people means one thing, his crushing defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. But does that make him our greatest commander? In my opinion, Waterloo wasn't Wellington's greatest victory but he had studied the strengths and weaknesses of his greatest adversary, Napoleon, and that is a mark of military greatness. His fascination with Napoleon is clear at his London home. Wellington's collection shows you that he was acquiring objects, either of the Bonaparte family or of Napoleon himself, throughout his entire life. This is a very small format portrait of Wellington. And as you can see, he's contemplating this bust of Napoleon. He had a complex relationship with Napoleon. He praised his military genius. He intimated that his presence on the battlefield was equal almost to that of 40,000 men. But yet, he also despised him. He, he thought he was ungentlemanly. He, didn't like his lack of care for his troops. But yet th th there is this ambiguous relationship and I think this painting really indicates that in a nutshell. 20 years of soldiering had brought Wellington to this point and soon he would finally face Napoleon across a battlefield in Belgium. Wellington had the force of character, the self-confidence, and above all, the ability to engender tremendous loyalty from his men. Even from the Dutch, Belgian, and German soldiers, he now found himself commanding. Working with allies is a mark of a great commander, and Wellington was a master at it. He was working with the Prussians, led by Field Marshal von Blücher. Napoleon knew that he had to stop the two armies meeting, so he attacked both simultaneously. Wellington's troops came under attack at a place called Quatre Bras. Today, the crossroads at Quatre Bras looks pretty unremarkable, but in 1815, it was key to Napoleon's fortunes. It's a strategic junction lying on the main road to Brussels and also on the communication route between Wellington's army and that of the Prussians. Napoleon committed themselves to fighting two battles at once, six miles apart. One against the Prussians at Ligny, and one against Wellington here at Quatre Bras. Wellington had to move fast to hold the crossroads, and by nightfall, the French had had about 4,000 casualties, and the Anglo-Dutch around 5,000. Meanwhile, seven miles away, 
Napoleon's troops met the Prussians in the village of Ligny. A French battalion has fought its way into the outskirts of the village behind me there. They've taken some casualties, but there's still about 400 of them left. And they're coming down this road, packed shoulder to shoulder, when suddenly, from number 42, away across the road there, the windows are flung wide, and they find themselves looking down the muzzle of a Prussian 12-pounder cannon. And there's a great gout of smoke and flame, and about 200 musket balls come winging up the road and take out about 60 Frenchmen. And it gets worse. That battalion is reduced to about 300 now, but they press on towards the center of the village. Hidden behind the church here, there's half a company of Prussian infantry. On the word of command, they swing out across the road, level their muskets and fire two volleys. <laughs> Down go another 100 Frenchmen. But at the end of the day, numbers and experience told, and only nightfall saved the Prussians from complete destruction. They took 16,000 casualties and they lost 21 guns. But although they were roundly defeated, they weren't routed. And instead of retreating towards Germany and home, as Napoleon had hoped, they withdrew north so they could still cooperate with Wellington if needed. It's this loyalty that Wellington was able to inspire in his allies, even in the face of defeat, that I believe marks him out as a brilliant leader. I see you've got old Blucher up there. Yes, um, Blücher was, of course, in charge of the Prussian army. We were lucky, weren't we, that, that Blücher and Wellington had this great relationship. I think that's what was so critical to Wellington. He was a man of honesty. He did inspire loyalty, not just in his troops, but in men like Blücher. Mm. Um, so Blücher had said to Wellington, I will be there, and be there he was. Mm. Wellington now faced one of the greatest challenges of his career, and one that would make him a household name throughout Europe. In a repeat of the tactics he used in Spain, he would cleverly conceal his troops near the village of Waterloo. On the 18th of June, 1815, it all came to an end here on the battlefield of Waterloo, a small, tightly packed killing field with 160,000 soldiers in an area less than two miles square. Wellington distributed his troops along this ridge. He was able to use the lie of the land to conceal most of his infantry on the far side, using the reverse slope to protect them from French artillery. What he had to do was stick on this ridge, allow Napoleon to attack him head on, and then hold him off until the Prussians could arrive. Again, Wellington would borrow heavily from his experience in the Peninsular War. Wellington, the master tactician, studied the terrain and recognized the importance of holding the three farms that crossed the battlefield. They were easy to defend with only a small number of men, but Napoleon believed he could now lure Wellington into weakening his center by staging an attack on one of them. This is Houchemont Farm. It was held by the light companies of the British Guards, about 800 men altogether. So when that first French attack erupts out of the south, it's blown away by musketry from the roofs, from the windows, from loopholes in the walls. The French try again from the north this time. And briefly, some of them do get into the courtyard. And then it's a barroom brawl. It's musket butts and bayonets and boots and fists until eventually the gate is closed and the last few Frenchmen still alive in here are skewered to death. Wellington had the advantage as the battle for the farm tied up thousands of French troops. A number of the British wounded were burned to death in the chapel here. Nevertheless, that tiny handful of guardsmen held on and the French never did capture Hougemont Farm. And now Napoleon threw forward his infantry. Eight and a half thousand men tramped up this slope straight for Wellington's line. They were hammered by the British guns. They were blasted by British musketry. And they were scattered by British cavalry. Napoleon's old tactical magic wasn't working. As Wellington said, they came on in the same old way. And we beat them 
in the same old way. It was the ultimate test for Wellington. Would his reputation be enough to ensure the loyalty of his troops as they defended the ridge? Would Blucher keep his promise? By evening, he had his answers. The Prussians were on the field, the French were now outnumbered, and the British guards blew them into bloody shreds. At the end of the day, 40,000 men and 15,000 horses lay dead or wounded on that field. Even for the normally tight-lipped Wellington, it was almost too much to bear. As he said, next to a battle lost, the greatest misery is a battle gained. It was a great victory, but most of those inexperienced Dutch and Belgian and German troops wouldn't have stayed on this ridge for anyone else but Wellington. And the Prussians wouldn't have stayed in Flanders for anyone else but Wellington. Could Wellington have won the Battle of Waterloo without the Prussians? Wrong question. He'd never have fought the battle if he hadn't known that the Prussians were on the way. It may not have been Wellington's most difficult battle, but it couldn't have been won without him. From an unpromising start, Wellington had transformed himself into a great leader and a successful commander the only man to beat all of Napoleon's generals before finally defeating the mighty emperor himself. Wellington never fought another battle, but then he didn't have to. Waterloo made Britain a world power, the only world power for a century. Before Wellington, there was rarely a victory. After Wellington, there was rarely a defeat. He was Britain's greatest general.